Chapter Three of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In a moonlit garden, she drew back from the window like a startled fawn, timorous yet curious too, for she ran only a few steps, then turned and stood peering. The moonlight slanted over the western roof of the building and fell on her. A slight boyish figure in short tattered trousers and a boy's shirt, open at her slim, rounded throat. The moonlight gleamed on the white shirt fabric to show it's torn and ragged. Her arms were upraised. Her head, with clustering flying dark curls, was tilted as though listening for a sound from me. A shy, wild creature, drawn to my window, tapping to awaken me, then frightened at what she had done. I opened the garden door. She did not move. I thought she would run, but she did not. The moonlight was on me as I stood there. I was conscious of its etching me with its silver sheen. And twenty feet from me this girl stood and gazed, with startled eyes and parted lips, and white limbs trembling like a frightened animal. The patio was very silent. The heavy arching fronds stirred slightly with a vague night breeze. The moonlight threw a lacy dark pattern of them on the gray stone path. The fountain bowl gleamed white in the moonlight behind the girl, and in the silence I could hear the low splashing of the water. A magic moment, unforgettable. It comes to some of us just once, but to all of us it comes. I stood with its spell upon me. Then I heard my voice, tense, but softly raised. Who are you? It frightened her. She retreated until the fountain was between us. And as I took a step forward, she retreated further, noiseless, with her bare feet treading the smooth stones of the path. I ran and caught her at the doorway of the flowered pergola. She stood trembling as I seized her arms. But the timorous smile remained and her eyes, upraised to mine, glowed with misty starlight. Who are you? This time she answered me. I am called Jetta. It seemed that from her white forearm within my grasp a magic current swept from her to me and back again. We humans, for all our clamoring, boasting intellectuality, are no more than puppets in nature's hands. Are you Spawn's daughter? Yes. I saw you a while ago when I was having my meal. Yes, I was watching you. I thought you were a boy. Yes, my father told me to keep away. I wanted to meet you, so I came to wake you up. He may be watching us now. No, he is sleeping. Listen, you can hear him snore. I could indeed. The silence of the garden was broken now by a distant, choking snore. We both laughed. She sat on the little mossy seat in the pergola doorway, and on the side away from the snore. I had the wit to be sure of that. I wanted to meet you, she repeated. Was it too bold? I think that what we said sitting there, with the slanting moonlight on us, could not have amounted to much. Yet for us, it was so important, vital, building memories which I knew, and I think that she knew, even then, we would never forget. I will be here a week, Jetta. I want, I want very much to know you. I want you to tell me about the world of the Highlands. I have a few books. I can't read very well, but I can look at the pictures. Oh, I see. A traveler gave them to me. I got them hidden. But he was an old man. All men seem to be old except in the pictures, and you, Philip. I laughed. Well, that's too bad. I'm mighty glad I'm young. And in that moment, with blessed youth surging in my veins, I was glad indeed. Young, I don't remember ever seeing anyone like you. The man I am to marry is not like you. He is old, like father. I drew back from her, startled. Mary? Yes, when I'm seventeen. The law of Narita 
Your Highland law, too, father says, will not let a girl be married until she is that age. In a month, I am seventeen. Oh, I stammered, but why are you going to marry? Because father tells me to, and then I shall have fine clothes. It is promised me, and go to live in the highlands, perhaps, and see things, and be a woman, not a ragged boy forbidden to show myself, and... I was barely touching her. It seemed as though something, some vision of happiness, which had been given me, were fading, were being snatched away. I was conscious of my hand moving to touch hers. Why do you marry unless you are in love? Are you? Her gaze, like a child, came up to meet mine. I never thought much about that. I have tried not to. It frightens me until tonight. She pushed me gently away. Don't. Let's not talk of him. I'd rather not. But why are you dressed as a boy? I gazed at her slim but rounded figure in tattered boy's garb. But the woman's lines were unmistakable, and her face, with clustering curls, gentle girlhood, a face of dark, wild beauty. My father hates women. He says they all are bad. It is a sin to wear women's finery, or it breeds sin in women. Let's not talk of that. Philip, tell me. Oh, if you could only realize all the things I want to know. In great New York, there are theaters and music? Yes, I said, and began telling her about them. The witching of this moonlit garden. But the moon had presently sunk, and to the east the stars were fading. Philip, look. Why, it's dawn already. I've got to leave you. I held her just a moment by the hand. May I meet you here tomorrow night, I asked. Yes, she said simply. Good night, Jetta. Good night. You, you have made me very happy. She was gone into a doorway of the opposite wing. The silent, empty garden sounded with the distant, reassuring snores of the still sleeping spawn. I went back to my room and lay on my bed and drifted off on a sea of magic memories. The world, my world, before this night, now seemed to have been so drab, empty, lifeless. But now there was pulsing, living magic in it for me. I drifted into sleep, thinking of it. End of chapter 3